Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our second LEADS educational session. Um, happy Friday. Hopefully you all, it's sunny where you are. It's nice and sunny here, which is kind of nice. Um, so there is a link in the chat box. Um, if you have not completed the pretest that we sent you, if you could take a minute to to finish that, we would much appreciate it. Um, our students are just collecting data and we try to look at what happens from year to year with LEAD. So we'd appreciate your input into our pretest. And we'll have a post test at the end of the event so that you can, um, can let us know what you thought. Um, my name is Beryl Cohen. I'm the executive director of the National Association of Social Workers, Indiana chapter. Um, we, uh, sorry, I was just, so um, you should be able to, hopefully everybody can hear. Um, Rich, I'm muting you. You need to mute yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna go through um, our lead educational session today. We're happy to have you here. Uh, there are, there's a question box that you can ask questions in. So please, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in there. We'll be more than happy to answer them. Um, please be patient if you ask a question and it takes me a few minutes to get to it. We have over 200 of you in um, the room joining us this morning. And uh, so that's a lot of people for us to try and answer everybody's questions. So. Um, if we don't answer your questions today, we will, I promise I will do my best. I shouldn't say I promised I will do my best. I will do my best to make sure that we can get you some answers um, uh, as we move through things. And if we don't answer them today, we will see if we can get some frequently asked questions up. If you are in a program and so you're doing this as part of your school, um, ask your faculty member. Uh, they may be able to get you an answer or they can send me emails with your questions and I can try and answer them that way. So hopefully that works for everybody. Again, there's a question box at the bottom of, uh, uh, on your toolbar. Um, so, uh, okay, so I saw a couple questions about not being able to hear. So If you can hear, can you guys raise your hand if you can hear? Okay. All right, there's a bunch of you raising your hands. Okay. Now I I can, okay, so you all think this is really funny, but I can hear myself, right? So I have no idea what you can hear. All right, thank you all very much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and drop everybody's hands. Um, if you are having problems with the audio, um, the easiest solution is to check your audio tab. So give me one second. So if your audio settings aren't set for your system, you won't have audio. And we do have a phone number that you can call in on if you need to. So with that, um, now that it's 10.03, I'm going to jump in and go ahead and get us started. Again, my name is Beryl Cohen. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Social Workers, Indiana Chapter. Um, I am thrilled to be able to in welcome you all to our 22nd year of LEAD. Um, I have had the honor of being part of LEAD for um, since its inception. So I was part of the founding of LEAD and um, I have been involved in it on and off um, since it started. Uh, I'm happy to be the executive director. I've been here for uh, almost four years. And on behalf of the chapter and, um, and our public policy committee, welcome to our educational day uh, around LEAD. Today, 
we are going to talk a little bit about NASW and who we are. We'll talk about why social workers advocate, the legislative process, types of advocacy, um, how you can use your direct practice skills to advocate, uh, advocacy concerns and fears, because we all have them. And we'll also cover some of the bills that we are following um, this session and some other bills that are of interest this year. The goals are for you to learn a bit more about who we are at NASW, to increase your understanding of why social workers should advocate and why it's important, how you can have a positive influence on impacting legislation and making changes, and then make sure that you understand the legislative process because um, most of us learn it in high school um, and that's about it. Or we see that I'm just a bill by Schoolhouse Rocks and that's about all we ever get. So hopefully after we get done today, you will have a better understanding of how the legislative process works in Indiana. So NASW uh, has been around for 65 years. We just celebrated our 65th birthday in October of uh, 2020. So while 2020 wasn't the best of times, we did celebrate our 65th anniversary. NASW, we are the largest membership organization of professional social workers in the world. Um, we have about 1,800 members here in Indiana, and Indiana is one of 55 chapters around the country. So we are all over the United States, including uh, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Our primary functions are to promote professional development for our members, establishing and maintaining professional standards of practice, advancing sound social policies, providing services to protect members and enhance our professional status, which also then protects our clients and the people we serve. Um, and then we also provide and sponsor all kinds of trainings and CEH events at the local, uh, state and national level. In Indiana, we have 10 regions uh, and you all are represented by our, uh, of course, we have the president, vice president, those positions, but we also have our regional rep each of our regions has a rep. Um, Region 7 has two reps, and then we also have a, both a BSW and MSW student representative. If any of you are BSW students and are interested in being our BSW student rep on our board, and you're an NASW member, please send us an email. We'd love to talk to you about joining our board. Um, we have a number of committees, and so we have, our, we have a committee on sexual orientation and gender identity a committee on racial and ethnic diversity. We have our public policy advocacy and lead committee, which helps plan our lead event, as well as doing our work around public policy and advocacy. Advocacy. We have a political action committee. So most of you probably know it as a PAC. For us, we call it PACE, which is our political action and candidate education committee. Um, and we also have a, a annual conference committee that helps plan our conference every year. So people always ask me like, well, why should I join? And um, the easy answer for you is that we are your professional association and we represent social workers in the state of Indiana. And we work to make sure that your license um, is maintained in the state um, and that you have, you know, we, we try to make sure that nobody can step on your toes and um, negatively impact that license. Uh, but there are so many other reasons. We have a ton of information uh, on our website. We have we do advocacy at both the state level as well as the federal level. Um, our federal uh, legislative folks just put out a long document on all of our policy initiatives for the next um, for this congressional round, so the next two years in the in Congress. We have resources for your career. We have a job bank here in Indiana. There's also a national job bank. We also have national job fairs every once in a while. We have one scheduled for, I believe, mid-March. Um, training and education as a member. We, You have the ability to get at least eight free CEs every year towards your, um, your requirements. Um, you also get a discount on all of your education through us as a member. You can get both an ethics and or legal consult through us, either through myself, I don't do the legal consults, but, or through our national office. We have a ton of resources. Um, 
we have access to malpractice insurance. And then the most important thing and the thing that's been most valuable to me is the professional network you can build. Uh, as a member of NASW, I've been a member since 1996 when I, um, well, I'm sorry, 1993, when I graduated since 1996, when I came back to Indiana and have um, been active in the chapter. And, you know, being able to meet people from around the state, interact with them, see them at the annual conference, get the information, get involved. Um, it's a great way to build a professional network. And so if you're not a member, I encourage you to consider joining. Um, as I said, we have been around for 65 years. We are the only profession, the only helping profession, which requires social justice and advocacy as part of our professional code of ethics. Um, and so I really encourage you to check out our website, the national website, um, and to, to see how you can get involved. Um, and I did this the other day and I did it again today. So I do have some polls and I forgot to, of course, launch the first one, which I was supposed to launch before I started talking through all of this. So uh, I am going to launch the first poll um, and it should be up on your screens. And so the question is, are you uh, a student? Are you working with your BSW or MSW? Um, it is possible to be both a student and working. So um, I was only, this is the number of options I could give you all. So I couldn't put in everything that I wanted, but we're just interested to know who's watching today. and. Um, it just helps us kind of plan. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thank you all for responding. Um, and I will share the results so that you know who else is in the I always feel really funny saying this. Who's in the virtual room with all of you? Um, so we have a lot of BSW students, um, some MSW students, and we have uh, a couple of PhD students. Very nice. Well, and some people who are working. And so thank you all for joining us. Um, LEAD is a really important part of what we do. Advocacy is a really important part of, um, of social work. And it really is the key to getting things done. And honestly, um, the more people we have supporting us and um, and backing us and helping us, the more likely we are to be able to be successful in getting things done. So questions, uh, and I think I saw one. Um, so uh, what is the best way to utilize NASW as a student? Um, you know, we have, so, one of the things, and I did forget to mention this, so we have a new uh, resource through and through the national office. Um, it's called My NASW, and so My NASW is an online community. Um, we are slowly building a community within the My NASW platform, so it's kind of a mix between Facebook and um, and uh, LinkedIn. So it's a way for members to connect from anywhere. So if you're an NASW member, no matter where, um, no matter where you live, you can be part of my NASW. And so you can actually um, talk to people and we will have a student uh, community in that um, so that you can, uh, oop, there you go. Sorry, thank you for whoever said that the results were still showing. Um, so as a student, we were we are creating a my NASW community within a student community within my NASW, so that you can actually um, talk to other students in other parts of the country, and have that conversation with them about what they're doing, and you can ask questions, and you can. The other thing that's really nice with my NASW is that if you're a student and you're getting ready to move, or if you're working and you're getting ready to move to another part of the country, you can actually ask those questions and see what opportunities are available. Um, and talk to people. Um, so there are all kinds of opportunities to get involved. It's really just what you're interested in. And I know as students, sometimes it's hard to find the time. Um, I, and as professionals, sometimes it's hard to find the time. So are there other questions? I think I got them all. Um, 
All right, so why social workers should advocate. And this is, I've always been surprised at this question um, because it's always been a part of what I have believed in and part of why I became a social worker was because I wanted to work in policy. I didn't want to work in direct service. I wanted to do policy work. And um, so it's always kind of surprising me when people ask me because to me it's obvious, but I know that it's not, it's, it's harder sometimes. Um, and so we advocate for a variety of reasons. We advocate because it helps us represent the people we serve. So if you're working um, with a homeless population, you know what challenges they face. They may not have the ability to go in and talk to a legislator, but you can talk to them on their behalf. You can share what happens in your, your agency, what you've experienced. Um, and if you've been homeless and are a social worker, you can share that piece too. It's an important part of our code of ethics uh, it's a way that we can provide professional expertise to policymakers. Most policymakers don't understand what we do. They don't understand the difference between uh, social workers and mental health counselors. Some of them truly, I know that you all probably have all heard this, social workers, anybody can be a social worker. It's not true. You all are living it or have lived it. You know it's not an easy thing. You have to work hard to get your degrees. Um, so making sure that we change the, that stereotype that, you know, anybody can be a social worker uh, or we don't really learn all that much and our school's not that important. It really is. And we can share that information and share that expertise and help other folks understand what it is that we do. And it's a great way to, to be an empower, empowerment role model for ourselves, as well as for the people we serve by helping them and showing them how they can make a difference and change things. So, Rich, did you want to do this part? Yes. Hello. Okay. Uh, my name's Rich uh, Kazmala. I am an uh, MSW student through IU Direct. Um, and I'm just going to talk for um, just a little bit about how the Code of Ethics calls us as social workers um, to get involved in, in policy and, and advocacy. Um, so the code of ethics um, is broken up into kind of two sections. There's the principles and the value section, which kind of provides broad um, a broad overview of some of the, the guiding uh, principles that we follow. And then there's the standards part, which kind of lay out a little bit more detail of what's expected. So in the first part here, the, the, the main values that um, relate to advocacy and policy work is the first one is service. That's the value. The eth ethical principle is social workers' uh, primary goal is to help people in need and address social problems. Um, it's one big way you can address social problems is through um, influencing how laws are made, through, through legislation, through the people who are making decisions, the policy decisions, influencing their decisions. Um, the second value is social justice. Um, social workers um, challenge social injustice. Um, social justice is um, an important value because it's about fairness. It's about people being treated equally. It's about um, vulnerable populations and people we work with getting what they need to make sure that they can they can succeed and then a couple other values here that that relate to advocacy include dignity and worth of the person um, that as social workers we we respect the inherent dignity and worth of, of each individual um, the importance of human relationships that social workers recognize the central importance of human relationships and then finally integrity that we um, always behave in a trustworthy uh, manner. So here is part of the standards that um, we're highlighting to show that it, as a social worker who is bound by the, goal, by the uh, code of ethics that you have a responsibility to uh, part participate in policy advocacy. Um, so the first is just the uh, section one, the social workers ethical responsibilities to their clients. 
their commitment to the clients. Um, and again, your primary responsibility is to promote the right of clients. Um, that can be in the local level, helping them achieve, get resources or services they need, but it's also to promote their rights through, again, broader policy goals. Um, then we have section five, which discusses social workers' ethical responsibilities to the social work profession. Um, and the, uh, 501, which is the integrity of the profession. And as social workers, we uphold and advance the values, ethics, knowledge, and missions of the profession. Social workers should contribute time and professional expertise to activities that promote respect for the value, integrity, and competence of the profession. Um, and they give some examples, um, which include teaching, research, and legislative testimony, which is uh, a lot about this presentation. We'll, we'll show you how the legislative process works and how you can be a part of that. Um, and then section six of these standards, um, pretty much the entire section relates to social workers being called to participate in policy and, and advocacy. Um, and this is under the, the, the broad category of, of social workers' responsibility to a broader society. Uh, so section 601 has social welfare. Social workers should promote the general welfare of society from local to global levels and the development of people, their communities, and their environments. Social workers should advocate for living conditions conducive to the fulfillment of basic human needs and should promote social, economic, political, and cultural values in institutions that are compatible with the realization of social justice. Um, again, I think that covers and gives a pretty clear explanation of what the ethics mean by social justice and fighting against social injustice. Um, and then subsection 604 is broken down into a couple of his other subsections, but again, um, shows how we are called to participate in advocacy. Uh, section A, social workers should engage in social and political action that seeks to ensure that all people have equal access to the resources, employment, services, and opportunities they require to meet their basic human needs and to develop fully. Social workers should be aware of the impact of the political arena on practice and should advocate for changes in policy and legislation to improve social conditions to be basic human needs and promote social justice. Um, that's about as clear as it can get, that, you know, explicitly states participating in the political arena and influencing legislation to improve social conditions. Um, and then three other sections here, B, C, and D add to that. Uh, B is to act to expand choice and opportunity for all people. Um, and with, with special regards for vulnerable, disadvantaged, oppressed, and exploited people and groups, um, often disadvantaged, oppressed, vulnerable groups don't have um, the same political capital or political uh, influence that other people have. And that's why we need to advocate for their best interests because it's unjust that they don't have that same uh, opportunity that we all have. Um, C is to promote conditions that encourage respect for cultural and social diversity within the United States and globally. We should promote policies and practice to demonstrate respect for the differences, support the expansion of cultural knowledge and resources, advocate for programs and institutions that demonstrate cultural competency, and promote policies that safeguard the rights of the, that safeguard the rights of and confirm equity uh, and social justice for all. And then finally, um, section D, which is social workers are called to act to prevent and eliminate. Uh, domination of, exploitation of, and discrimination against any person, group, or class based on race, um, ethnicity, national origin, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, um, or expression, age, marital status, political belief, religion, uh, immigration status, or mental or physical ability. Um, and again, I think if we take all of this together, it provides us a pretty clear a picture of what the Code of Ethics means by fighting for social justice.
and now we have questions. Yeah, so the the thing to remember when you're thinking about the code of ethics is that it advocacy is throughout the code of ethics. Um, Rich, can you mute, please? Thanks. Um, sorry, we get echoes if we don't, if we're all on screens or all on mics or on, um, and I don't want that to happen. So the the code of ethics really does it. It is everything that we do, everything that we look at when we're looking at what bills to follow. We look at the code of ethics when we're making arguments about why we should support something or not, or why legislators should should make a change or not. We do. We look to the code of ethics. We look to the code of ethics. We look to social work speaks, um, and those are the ways that we try to figure out what it is that we want people to do and how to make things better. Are we perfect? Um, no, I don't think any of us are. Um, and we still have a long way to go, but we're working on it. So are there questions? I just lost my question box. There was one question about why aren't there more social work politicians? So there actually, um, there are a, a number of social work politicians, um, and I, I, of course, don't have my list in front of me. We have a list on the national website. Uh, there are a number of social workers in Congress. I actually can't give you all of their names because um, because I never, I haven't looked since the last election. Everything finished up with the last election to pull that new list. We have had a couple of social workers in Indiana who have been uh, elected officials. Um, we've had uh, in South Bend, there was a member of the um, your county council, city council. I'm sorry, I don't remember which what it was, which one it was. In Indianapolis, we have a city county council. Everybody's just slightly different, but there was um, you had an elected official there. Uh, so we have them scattered around. I know that we probably have some that are on school boards and other places. Um, I think to some extent. Part of the reason is that I have social workers who've told me that they don't understand it. They don't feel like they can make a difference. Um, so I think it's really just a matter of trying to think about um, what kind of change you want to make and how you can make that change. So is it as an elected official? Is it working on somebody's campaign? Is it helping somebody else get elected? Uh, or is it providing them with information and education? So hopefully that answered your question. There is a another question I see for, about joining. Um, so for students, the cost to join as a student is $60. It's um, an annual membership. It's $60 a year. Um, once you graduate, the, your dues go up and it's dependent on uh, whether you are uh, getting your bachelor's or your master's. We do have transitional years. So if you join as a student and you keep and maintain your membership as you gra after you graduate, then your membership slowly goes up in cost. Um, if you let it lapse, then you would end up with, um, you would have to pay the full cost. So it really just depends. You can find the information on our national website, which is uh, socialworkers.org. And I that is in um, one of the, the last slides in, in this presentation. And I forgot to tell you all that. You can find the presentation in the handouts button on the, in the go to um, system, which you have probably already found that. Um, because I didn't tell you all, but I'm sure you already found that piece. So, what are some positions, job titles for people who are trying to make an impact on larger policies? Um, you know, you can see people have titles of government relations. Um, um, so government of relations, government affairs, lobbyist, um, for NASW, um, we all, almost every single executive director is also a registered lobbyist. Um, so it just kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're working from a policy perspective, um, I, I ran a project for five and a half years on poverty and welfare, and I did all kinds of advocacy and I was a project manager. So it really just depends um, on what, what it is that you're doing. Uh, so if you're working just on the policy side, I mean, you can work, there are people who uh, 
there's a, a number of social workers that are part of or will be part of uh, President Biden's cabinet and other positions within the administration. Um, so they will have all kinds of titles. So uh, it, there are all kinds of ways to do it. Um, and then in, as far as who employs them, it really just depends on what you're doing. Um, I've worked for small not-for-profits. Like I said, I, I ran a project on poverty and welfare and lobbied and did policy work. I was also a state employee for um, the O'Bannon and Kernan administrations and did policy work at a much larger level as far as implementing state level programs. So you can work at all levels. Um, it's it's not always easy. I'm, I'm not going to tell you that getting into policy work as a social worker is an easy thing. It's not. Um, but it is uh it is something that you can do with your degree. And that's one of the advantages of all of your degrees is that you can do all kinds of things um, with your degrees. So uh, we are gonna jump into the next section because I think I got all of the questions. I did have another poll I wanna launch just to see kind of how much you all know about some of the other stuff we'll talk about. So in this poll, um, the question is, this is my, first, second, or I've been to lead more than three times. And if you've been to lead more than two, three times, thank you for continuing to come back and join us. Um, again, this is just kind of for me to get an idea of how much detail I need to go into as we start talking about you know, how Bill becomes a law and that kind of stuff. So I'll give you guys just a few more seconds. All right, I'm gonna close it and I will share the results. So uh, for the majority of you, this is for your first time attending LEAD. Um, so uh, hopefully I will answer all the, your questions around public policy um, and the legislative process. So I will be completely honest and tell you that this is probably the most confusing part of the presentation to make sure that I do it well um, for you all. So if you have questions, we'll take questions at the end. Um, so one of the most important things to think about with the legislative process is that a bill is just an idea. That is how it starts. Somebody has an idea, they talk to a somebody who's a legislator and an elected official and say, I think this should happen. And the legislator, if they agree with you, then would send it to legislative services and get the language drafted into law, into a bill. And then that bill then has to go through all of the steps in the process. If it gets stuck at any point in time during the process, it can die and it will not happen this year. Um, so y'all may have watched uh, the Schoolhouse Rocks, I'm Just a Bill. This is a similar process. It's not quite as complicated, I don't think, um, but I will not be singing and dancing for you, so, um, which is probably a good thing. So we're gonna start, uh, and I'm gonna use a bill that we've got uh, this year. So um, this is our second year of uh, asking somebody to introduce a bill on diagnosis. So currently in the state of Indiana, um, the only people who can complete a diagnosis are doctors and psychologists with a special certifi certification called an HSPP. Um, so clinical level social workers, LCSWs, are not able to diagnose. They can do a diagnostic impression, but they can't diagnose. Um, they can't do the complete official diagnosis. And so what that means is, is that uh, we are one of two states, so it's Indiana and Alabama, that do not, do not allow clinical level social workers to diagnose. Um, so we had a bill introduced last year. We were one of 40 some odd bills in a committee. It was a short session. We didn't get a hearing last year. Um, we, uh, so we have had it introduced again this year. Um, I guess I should have, should have started by telling you all. So in Indiana, we have our, everybody's elected for two years, right? So our, our, we run in two year cycles for the General Assembly. So the first year, which is the odd year, which is 2021, is a budget year and it's a long session. So it will go from January till uh, the end of April. 
Short sessions are on even number years, which are also election years, and they will run from January to um, to the middle end of March. And so during a long session, the only thing that they have to get done that they are statutorily required to complete is a budget. Um, and then this year they have to do redistricting because of the census. They don't have to do anything else. In short session years, they don't typically deal with money uh, in the same way they don't do the budget. So every long session, they do a two year budget. Um, and they may make some changes during a short session, but they really don't do a whole lot with money on short sessions. So, uh, so we are in a long session, which gives us a little more time to get things through. Uh, so we have Senate Bill 82. We found an author. Uh, so Senator Michael Crater agreed to uh, author the bill for us. He had it sent to legislative services. It came out and it was uh, went through first reading and we were assigned to a committee. Um, so then we are currently waiting to, for committee action. So we are waiting to get a hearing, which hopefully we will get soon. So bill goes from first reading into a, and it's assigned to the committee, then the committee chair can decide if they're gonna hear the bill or not. If you don't get a hearing, nothing happens, your bill doesn't go anywhere. If you get a hearing, then that's an opportunity for you, your allies, and anybody who doesn't like it to testify testimony either for or against your bill. Um, the committee can uh, vote to, to pass the bill, they can amend the bill, or they can decide not to vote on it and not take any action on it, which does happen on occasion where a bill is heard, there's discussion, um, and it won't ever get a vote. Sometimes it doesn't get a vote because there's not enough time. Sometimes it doesn't get a vote because there's not enough agreement on the topic or there's something that needs to change, but nobody's really sure what to do. So there's all kinds of reasons why a bill can die, but you can be assigned to a committee and never get any further than that. You can have a hearing and never get any further than that. But hopefully, if I put it out there enough times, we'll get it. So we'll get the hearing. Um, Senate Bill 82 will then move uh, to the full floor of the Senate where all 50 senators will have the opportunity to vote on the bill. They again can amend the bill there. Um, they can vote to pass it or it can just never get a second hearing, a second reading vote. Um, there, there are time markers for each of these steps in the process. So if you don't have a committee hearing by the deadline for committee hearings, then you don't get through. If you don't pass out of second reading or third reading by the deadlines that are set by both the House and the Senate, then your bill dies. So hopefully, luckily, we'll make it through second reading. We'll go to third reading. We'll come out of third reading. And then from third reading, you come down and go over to the house and you have to go through all of those steps again in the house. At any point again in the house, the bill can die. Um, it cannot get a hearing. It can get a hearing and not, um, not pass. Um, if during the second, in the second house, it does, uh, the bill is changed, the content of the bill is changed. When it comes out at third reading, then it would go to a conference committee and both the Senate and the House, then there's members from both parties, both the Senate and the House sit down and they have to come to an agreement of, around what that language should be. So uh, there are times when a bill gets changed in the second house and the author, the original author of the bill is okay with those changes and the bill just can go through. But if there's, if the author in the first house that passed the bill does not agree to the changes, it will go to a conference committee at which point they have to come to consensus. That then comes out as a report that both chambers vote on again. Um, and if it passes out of both of those, then it would go to the governor's office. Uh, so, I'm not going to walk through these. These just walk through that what I just explained to all of you, just in case you ever come back and want to read this, you can you have the explanations. Um, if a bill, uh, once a bill goes through and is either gone through the conference committee and is completely done, it will go to the governor's office. The governor can then sign the bill, veto the bill, or decide not to sign the bill. Um, the bill can become law if he does not sign it within seven days. Um, Governor Holcomb has occasionally vetoed a bill. He vetoed a bill last year. Um, there is a chance, there is always a chance on a vetoed bill that the chambers could make the decision to try and override the veto. 
That is their right. Um, they need a constitutional majority in both houses to override the veto. It doesn't, like I said, he doesn't veto them very often, and so this doesn't happen very much. Um, all bills become effective on July 1st of the year that they are enacted or on a different effective date if that is what's specified. So sometimes a bill could get passed um, and there needs to be some back, some building up of rules or other pieces before the before they'll be able to implement the bill. And if that happens, then you could see a postponement in an, in an effective date to you know July 1 of 2022. Um, bills can also have multiple effective dates in them. So you know the first part of the bill is effective July 1, 2021, and then the second part happens in 2025. Um, so it just really depends on um, on the process and what the topic is. So I'm going to stop there, and I think there are questions. So, um, so there is a, the question about yes, it is too late to approach a legislator with an idea for a bill for this year. Um, so there are deadlines, um, and uh, at the end, I'll try and show you guys how to find that stuff. But there's a every session, every every two year cycle has its own deadlines and rules and dates and things like that. Um, so there are different dates for short session versus long session, depending on how much time they have. So the last day to, um, to file a bill and actually get it assigned to a committee, I believe was like January 12th or 14th. I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact date. The dates all changed a little bit. Um, I know you all are really surprised, right? We have this thing called COVID out there that has kind of made everything change a bit. So lots of dates have shifted just a bit. Um, so the, it is too late. If you have an idea of something that you want to do, I really encourage you to find your legislator as soon as the session is done and start having conversations with them. Um, our the bill that we have filed with the other four, uh, the other three mental health professions, um, we started working on that two and a half years ago, if not a little bit longer, with discussions between the four professions that are covered by our licensing board. So social work, mental health, marriage and family therapist, um, and addictions, we're all covered by the same licensing board. We sat down and started having conversations about what none of us can diagnose, how to, what language we would want. And then we spent, uh, so we spent time coming up, coming to consensus, we then spent time talking to um, allies as well as potential folks who might not like it. So talking to the psychologists, um, talking to psychiatrists, the associations that represent them to make sure that we can, um, we have their support or if we could make some tweaks in our language to get their support on a bill. So it, you, you really can't wait until session has started or even just a couple weeks before session. It really needs to start um, as early as you can, and I would encourage you to, you know, to spend that time when they are not in session, um, building that relationship with them. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so uh, the other question is, if a bill gets through the Senate but dies in the House, does it have to start in the beginning in the Senate again, or can it just start again in the House? So last year we had a bill, uh, it was introduced in the House. It never got a hearing. When the session is done, and it's the same thing with Congress, the uh, the the session. So we just elected a new. The I always get lost in words sometimes on this description. But so in 2021, we have a two-year cycle going for the General Assembly in Indiana. Each year is its own independent year. A bill that is filed one year that does not pass has to be refiled the next year. It doesn't matter if you start in the House or Senate, there's different strategies for why you would start in one versus the other, depending on your topic, depending on what committees you need to be in. There's all kinds of things that play into where you start your bill. Um, there are um, folks who start bills in one bill, they start the almost the exact same language in both houses and have the meat in the middle. It just really depends on your strategy uh, and what you're trying to do. But if a bill, so if Senate Bill 82 doesn't pass this year, 
um, or doesn't get through the Senate, then we really don't have any hope uh, unless we can figure out a way to get it into another bill and get it through all of the steps. Um, but it's much harder to do things that way. Uh, so it's so it's everything starts and the same thing happens in DC in Congress, which is at the end of their cycle, all the bills basically have to start again. Um, and then there's a question about when is it as early as you can. Uh, General Assembly, the sessions start in January each year. So short session runs January to the end of March, long session runs January to the end of April. Um, uh, you know, as early as you can is when you have an idea, if you have an idea of something that you wanna do and you, um, I would encourage you to find people who might also agree with you, have conversations with them about, can they help you do that? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of this stuff Tasha in the next section. So if I don't answer your question, you can ask it again. Um, so I think I got them all. Um, our next section is on advocacy and see uh, here I remember to put a little poll in there, although it's the wrong number, but that's okay. So I'm gonna launch another quick poll for you guys. I just kind of would like to find out um, what type of advocacy you've done and how you've been involved in um, in advocacy. So organizing a rally, talking to your legislators, helping people get um, registered to vote, working on somebody's campaign, running for a political office. These are all options. Um, and again, there are more options in this. I am only limited to five options though, so. Okay, I am going to go ahead and close the poll and I will share your results. So nice, nice mix, good. I have to say organizing a rally is not easy. Um, organizing any big event isn't easy. So for those of you who've helped organize or have organized a rally on your own, good for you. Um, it's a lot of work. So great, okay. So, um, we're gonna talk about some different types of advocacy. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. It is just some of the things you all can do or may have done, um, but things like, again, rallies, going to informational meetings. So, um, League of Women Voters has third house meetings where the, your um, member, either your congressional member in DC from the federal delegation, or your state representative or senator, they may have meetings in your local community and give you the opportunity to talk to them, ask them questions. Um, a great time to to meet and try and ask questions is uh, during campaigns when people have, uh, when they come out and talk about things that they want when they have their own rallies. Those are great opportunities to ask them questions about things that you're concerned about about things that you wanna know. How, what are they doing? How are they doing it? Um, emailing, uh, writing letters, boycotting products and services, um, doing action alerts, trying to help other people understand what it is that you have concerns about, educating your legislators and stakeholders. Um, legislators are just like you and me. They're elected officials, they work for us. Our tax dollars pay them. Uh, we need to hold them accountable. But if they've never seen a therapist, they don't know what a social worker does, they don't have that information. So how do we educate them? How do we provide that information so they understand better the challenges that we're facing, the people we serve are facing, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you can do direct lobbying. So if you uh, are doing it as a, as a citizen, you do not need to be registered if you're doing it representing a group, then there are some lobbying laws. So just please make sure that you keep that in mind. Um, you can organize testimonials from people who are affected and impacted by the policies. You can help people to register to vote, which is a great way to get involved and do advocacy. Um, the more people that vote, the more representative things can be. Um, you know, currently in Indiana, the Republicans have control of uh, the governor's office, as well as the House and the Senate. 
Um, there is a super majority uh, in the Senate um, and in the House. And yes, I am at currently talking about Republicans and Democrats, but I want to make sure that you all understand that the same thing, I would be saying the same thing if the Democrats were in control. So having one party have a super majority and more and, and, and a lot of power means that we're not really having representation of everybody in all positions. And so, um, you know, making sure that they understand what it is that you need and want and trying to work with folks. And then again, working with people to help them register to vote and making sure they know how to vote um, and making sure that you vote based on what you believe, um, not just a party because you believe in that party or because you were raised a Republican or Democrat and so that's the only way you, you vote. You really need to think about voting based on what your beliefs are and who's supporting what you do. Um, so things you can do, you can work with a legislator to write or introduce a bill. Uh, you can schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings to discuss a concern, organizing letter writing campaigns, working with people who have a direct line to a legislator. So uh, if somebody that you know's mom works for your senator, it's a great way to get in the door and talk to them. Um, providing testimony at a committee meeting. So making sure that you tell them what's going on and why something is important. Creating fact sheets and talking points that you can hand out to committee members and or to uh, your friends who might be able to help sway somebody's opinion about something. Making sure that you talk to other stakeholders, uh, so allies, people who are gonna support you. And it's really important to also know those people who aren't gonna support your position, to make sure that you talk to them and find out, or if you can't talk to them, because sometimes they don't wanna talk to you, which is fine. But if you can't talk to them, to try and find out what their concern is. Because if you can address that concern before you walk in the door of the General Assembly, then you're more likely to be successful. Uh, I think the most important thing to think about is make sure that your message is clear and concise um, and that you're very specific about what you're asking them to do. So this is what I need and this is why it's important and I'd like your support or opposition to, to Bill X. Um, and the final piece to think about is with advocacy is it happens at all levels. So at your local level, you have your school boards, your community councils, your city council, um, you have the state general assembly, uh, and then you have federal. And so you have to remember what happens where. So if you um, have a question about uh, federal taxes, talking to your member of the general assembly here, your local state representative, might not change anything because they have no say and they don't get to vote on federal issues. That would be your member of Congress. And so either our congressional member or one of the senators, right? So you just have to think about who you're talking to, but remember that it happens in all levels. And once a bill gets passed, you also then have to think about how is it being implemented and what are the rules around that? Um, so I've covered a lot of this already, but you know, before a bill is heard, making sure that you talk to the author, that they understand what it is you want. You talk to your committee members. Um, you can talk to your legislator. Uh, it's a great time to talk to other folks and have them call in support. Um, when it crosses over to the other side, again, the same kinds of uh, pieces. And then making sure that your message is really clear. If you don't have a clear message, then it, it will get lost. Um, Hopefully you all at some point in your lives maybe played a game of telephone when you're in school or something like that where, you know, you pass the message from one to the other. Messages get lost if they're very complicated. So trying to be as clear and concise as you can. Um, Senate Bill 82, really and truly, there, there are lots of things I could probably say and we do have in our fact sheets about Senate Bill 82. Um, but the reality is, is Indiana is one of two states that does not allow a licensed clinical social worker to diagnose, Indiana and Alabama. So 48 other states allow it to be in, within the scope of practice for licensed clinical social workers. That's a very clear, concise statement. It's simple. Um, so that's kind of our, that's our main piece. And then we have, we have all kinds of other supporting information, but that's really our main piece. Um, there are fears around advocacy. Um, 
I will honestly tell you that I have been uh, a registered lobbyist now for almost 12 years. I've been doing this work for 20 plus years. I still do not like having to get up in front of the General Assembly and testify. I don't know why, I just don't. Um, I get nervous, we all do. It's just part of what happens, I think. Um, but, you know, we've explained to you the process, it's really not that complicated, but if you know what your topic is uh, and you know how to, and you can be concise in your, in your, uh, in your statement, you'll be okay. Um, in the 20 plus years I've been doing this work and all the time I've spent at the state house, I can tell you that maybe I've had three confrontations that have felt um, uncomfortable. I don't know that I would say hostile, like somebody was threatening me, um, but where, where I was, I used to lobby on poor people's issues. Nobody really wanted to hear about poor people. Um, so it sometimes got a little hostile, but it, it, it again, it wasn't about me. I needed to not take it personally. So it doesn't happen very often. Um, and in fact, I would, I would, I would tell you that it, it's so rare. Um, so, you know, if you have public speaking anxiety, practicing what you're going to say, um, it is possible that somebody will ask you a question that you can't answer. Um, we are with Senate Bill 82. It is, co it covers uh, social work, mental health counselors, addictions, and uh, marriage and family therapist. I cannot speak for the other three professions. I do not understand their education, their licensing requirements. I don't know any of that. I know ours. I know what you need to have to be a licensed clinical social worker. So if somebody asks me about, well, what do you know, do the marriage and family therapists, what training do they have? My response is, I don't know, but I can find somebody who can help you understand that, right? So I don't have to know the answer, but I need to be able to direct them to somebody who can answer or say to them, I don't have the answer, but I will find you the answer and I'll get it to you. Um, if you say that, please make sure that you get them the answer. Um, it is always possible to be taken out of context. That is just part of life. So again, making sure that you have a clear, concise message and you stick to your message. Um, there are lots of people and getting through the state house sometimes can be a little scary because it's a big building. Um, but uh, everybody who's there is very helpful and anybody will help you find your way if you need, uh, if you need help. Um, when you're thinking about advocacy, I think it's really important to think about the fact that you all are learning direct practice skills. Those practice skills are the same skills you can use in policy practice. It's just instead of a client, you're talking to a colleague, you're talking to a legislator. I am not saying that you should treat them as you, you know, that, that they're a client to you. That's not the relationship, but you can use the same skills. So you would use engagement skills and your communication skills to build a relationship with your client. If you had a new client, you would use active listening to understand their perspective. Those are all the same kinds of pieces that you would use in talking to a legislator because they're not all going to agree with you. So making sure that you try to understand that different perspective. Um, uh, our assessment skills that we learn can help you in understanding and identifying solutions and opportunities, right? Your problem solving and negotiating skills. We're great at solving problems and collaborating. It's a great skill to use as you're looking at identifying people you can work with, as well as opportunities to collaborate with other folks. And sometimes you will identify um, allies that may have maybe enemies on every single issue you're working on, except for this one piece, and they will be your ally on this one piece. And it's okay, you don't have to agree on everything. You can sometimes take your enemies and, 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 they, and you all can work together on something and see success. So it's really important to know who your allies are and who is a potential ally, even if they've never supported you in the past. Um, I know there are some questions. I I'm almost done with this section and then I'll, I will get to the questions. So just some do nots. Again, please don't ever assume that they understand the bill. Um, I, I can tell you in talking to people and working on stuff for as long as I have, for the most part, they do not know. They may know a bit and bits and pieces of things, but they don't know all of the detail. Um, and so don't assume that they do. It's not that they're bad people, uh, but there are, you know, there's a lot of bills out there. 
And so they're not gonna know every detail of every bill. Um, you wanna make sure you don't go in with a hostile attitude. So don't go in with a chip on your shoulder. Uh, again, again, that can be a challenge if you're asking them to oppose a piece of legislation um, and you think that they're gonna be your enemy. Um, but you know, when you walk in with a chip on your shoulder, it doesn't work uh, and it doesn't get you anywhere. Please don't ever threaten or accuse people. Um, it is hard, I know, sometimes to realize that um, somebody doesn't agree with you or um, to accuse them of a belief that maybe they have or don't have. So just try to be really careful with it, what you do. Um, the most important thing and what may seem the hardest sometimes is to not engage in partisan politics. You know, the right to diagnose for clinical social workers, that is not a Republican or Democrat issue at all. It's just not. A lot of these issues are not really partisan. There may be partisan pieces around what you, um, around how we might solve the problem, but the, but the piece itself is not. Um, so just, you know, kind of think about that piece. Um, don't ever overstate what you, what you don't, what you think you know, or make guesses on things. It's not smart. Uh, don't make a promise that you can't keep please don't get into arguments with somebody over something that's morality. Um, so if it's a moral issue, you know, we have to just agree to disagree. Um, try to be really clear and concise with your language. When I talk to legislators, you know, there are lots of people, I'm sure, well, hopefully y'all have, have heard this, I, maybe you haven't, but um, the term social work gets thrown around a lot as being um, just about anybody, right? So Oh, that case manager. Oh, they're a social worker. Oh, that they're a social worker. A social worker is somebody who has a BSW or an MSW and holds a license. That is a social worker. So trying to really use the right terms and making sure that other folks who are talking about your issue are using the right terms. So we have three different levels of licenses in the state of Indiana. We have a bachelor's, a master's, and a, a, a clinical level. I am, when we're talking about Senate Bill 82, we are talking about licensed clinical social workers. And that is the term I always use when I talk about it with legislators is it's licensed clinical social workers. It's not to say that folks who have their LBSW or their LSW aren't doing good work, but for diagnosis, we are solely talking about clinical level social workers. So again, making sure that you use the right terms. Um, and the final piece, which I'm sure you all already know is, Make sure you always thank them for the time that they give you and um, uh, and for spending time with you because it's really important that they do that. Um, so uh, the um, so I just want to touch on this briefly. There are all kinds of controversial issues. I know I've kind of touched on this as I've gone through the presentation. There are all kinds of controversial issues out there, and it's really important um, that you that you try to stick to the facts um, and think about what do you want to accomplish. So, if I think that um, that well, I'll just use this the example that I've used in the past, which is you know I don't I don't own a gun, I don't I don't like guns, I understand that other people like them and that's fine, right? But if um, if I walk into a legislator's office and I wanna have a conversation about safety and gun control and they are just like, they are a supporter of everybody should have a gun, they're sponsoring a bill that would allow guns to be in every school building and every school teacher to carry a gun, which there've been bills like this in the past. Um, if I walk into that legislator's office and say to them, I think guns are horrible. I don't think anybody should own a gun. I have now basically completely alienated that legislator, right? They are not gonna listen to me at that point. But if I walk in and I say to them um, that I am concerned that I think we should have, make sure that there's safety protocols, that might get me in the door. And so really thinking about what is it you want to accomplish and who do you have to talk to and how do you um, how do you walk in and try and allay those fears and misconceptions 
and come to a point of consensus instead of divisiveness. It's never easy to have a conversation. Um, I helped create the state's earned income tax credit. It took a couple of years, and I can't tell you how many offices I walked in where, where I said, you know, poor people pay taxes, and I was told on multiple occasions that I was crazy and poor people didn't pay taxes, even though I had all the facts in front of me. So um, it is really hard sometimes when it's something that can become very partisan to have those discussions, but just think about what is it you really want to accomplish. Um, just a couple of things to remember. So you are the expert. If you're talking about an issue that you know, you are the expert. Uh, and make sure that you, you state what you know, don't overstate it. Make sure you stick to your message and check your facts. Um, again, remember your social work skills of affirming positive intentions, finding common ground, building those relationships. Uh, earlier, there was the question about like how early is too early to get started with things. Um, if you don't know who your legislator is, now is the perfect time to start. Get to know them. If they've got a bill that you like, send them a note and tell them, thank you for sponsoring that bill. If they have a bill you don't like, tell them you don't like it um, and you'd like to talk to them about it. Maybe they'll have time now, maybe they'll, they won't. Maybe you'll have to talk to them off session. But building those relationships, because that's what's really important. Um, I've lived in the same house uh, for the last 20 years. Um, I grew up in Indianapolis, so I, I have the benefit of knowing a lot of uh, people who are, I know a number of legislators who I either knew from growing up or I met when I moved back to Indiana. Um, and so, they're, some of them are friends of mine and have been for a long time. I have a different relationship with them than the ones who I don't know as well, but making sure that you build those relationships um, and try to really have those conversations with them so that they know who you are when you call and you're not just a constituent who only calls them when they do something bad, because none of us like that. So I know that there are questions. Um, Let's see, hold on, sorry, I have to pull out the question box. There we go. All right, so um, so the um, the Senate bill for diagnosis, Senate bill 82, um, so there's a question about what a petition is and how effective they are. You know, it really just depends on um, on what the topic is. So if you're trying to get, um, if you're trying to get like a store closed down or a store opened up or something like that, a petition can be really effective depending on where you are. Um, there are different, different schools of thought on petitions and other things for legislative topics, depending on what state you're in, what the topic is. Um, it can, it can be helpful. Um, the challenge really is trying to make sure that, that petition, um, is clear and people understand what they're asking and know that just because you can walk in with a stack of, you know, 5,000 signatures, what else do you have? You know, you, you, that's not alone by itself going to be a successful piece. It has to be part of a bigger strategy. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did uh, at the beginning of this week, we sent out a legislative alert. It's actually posted um, on all our social media too, for asking people to um, email or call their senator. Um, and if they're on the committee, ask them to, you know, to co-author Senate Bill 82. Um, if they're not on, well, anybody can co-author the bill, but if they're on the uh, House and, or the Senate Provider, Senate Health and Provider Services Committee, sorry, get the name right, that they can, um, would they be willing to, uh, to co-author the bill? Would they be willing to help make sure we get a hearing? Um, because really and truly, it has to get out of the committee, but it also has to make it out of the full floor of the house. And so we need to have everybody. And so I know as of uh, yesterday morning, we had about 
60 or 70 um, letters that emails that went into senators um, and so hopefully we'll get a hearing so I that wasn't a complete answer only on um, petitions but hopefully that helped um, so when you when you're looking for bills and I'll get there in a couple minutes I'll show you um, uh, I'll show you the the website if if I have time um, when you go into the website, the General Assembly website, you have to make sure you're looking at this year in order to see this year's bill. So there are ways that you can do searches that aren't just for this year, but you just have to be careful. Um, so, okay, so there's a question about can a House representative uh, co-author a bill as well? So uh, a bill can be authored out of either the House or the Senate. Each uh, legislator, so each senator and each representative has a limit. There's a limit to the number of bills they can file every year. Um, anybody else can go on as either a co-author or a sponsor. So if a, how, a bill makes it through the House and it moves to the Senate, so the author is the person who initially wrote, wrote the bill and, and authored the bill, then there are co-authors who are supporting that bill. And then when it moves to the second House, that then becomes the sponsor. So then there's a second, in the second house, there's a sponsor of the bill and then there are co-sponsors. So yes, anybody can, um, uh, anybody can, can either co-author or sponsor depending on where the bill starts would depend on what you would, what you would be called, either a, an author, co-author, sponsor, co-sponsor. Um, and there are some rules to that, um, but, then there's a question about, uh, should you speak to your legislator with examples of personal experiences? Yes, um, personal experiences are really important. We know for a fact that um, psychiatrists are not really all that happy about letting us get the rights to diagnose for clinical social workers. Um, we've had a couple conversations with the psychiatrist, with the association that represents them, um, but we also have a handful of psychiatrists around the state who are working with with our members and people who you know with licensed clinical social workers um, and so we have a handful of members who have asked psychiatrists they know um, and we have I think right now four letters from four different psychiatrists supporting licensed clinical social workers to diagnose um, we have a couple of psychologists that we've asked to write letters of support for us to be able to for licensed clinical social workers to be able to independently diagnose um, and we've also um, we've got members and we've asked our members to send in letters and or come with us if we get a hearing so that when when we get a hearing um, to testify and be able to tell to explain to legislators what does this mean that you know how is it going to positively impact them and the people we serve. So those are all pieces of um, what it can mean. You know, being able to tell that story from a personal angle can really make the difference and help somebody really understand what it means. Um, so I am going to now jump to um, our public policy agenda. Um, I do have another quick poll. Um, so I'm going to launch this and um, I'm going to start talking about kind of the next section. Um, so the question is, have you visited the General Assembly website, watched a committee hearing either virtually or in person, or um, watched a uh, Senate or House session virtually or in person? And, you know, if you haven't already watched, um, this is a great time to do it. There are lots of hearings. They meet Monday through Thursday, they do typically do not meet on Fridays. Um, everything is accessible online. Um, and so I know I'm gonna cut this one short because I wanna make sure I get through the content. Um, uh, so, um, good, it looks like some of you have visited, good. Good, visited the website, watched committee hearings, wonderful. So um, I am not gonna spend a lot of time showing you the websites and stuff, but we do have a public policy agenda. It is on our website. Um, and our public policy committee puts together kind of a, a document that shows those areas that we are going to focus on. Um, we don't list out specific bills in this document because it is done before we have all of the bills listed. So we, 
again, you, I think you can see that this runs um, along the same lines as our code of ethics and the same kinds of things that we should be doing. Um, I've talked some about Senate Bill 82. Uh, it will define mental health diagnosis, which is currently not in statute. Uh, so it will allow uh, licensed clinical social workers and the other mental health clinical mental health license holders to diagnose independently, which will allow them to provide more services. So if you're in private practice and you need to have uh, somebody, you know, an HSPP or, or a doctor sign off, you typically have a relationship and are paying them to do that. And so if you could take that money invested into providing treatment to more people, we are now increasing access. It will speed up the ability for people to get services because we won't have to be waiting for diagnostic impression and in all, or for a diagnosis. And in all honesty, I don't think I have had anybody tell me um, in the last uh, year and a half, almost two years we've been working on this, I've never heard anybody say that their diagnostic impression was completely overturned. Because if there's a question about what a diagnosis is, as social workers, we usually go and get supervision and ask for help. So, um, so that is what we're working on. There are uh, a number of other bills. So there's a couple of telehealth bills that would actually allow, uh, would, would put telehealth into statute. So they change telemedicine to telehealth. Um, currently in Indiana, there is no state statute that allows uh, social workers to provide telehealth. We are allowed to do that through the governor's executive orders only. Um, so this would allow us to continue to provide and engage in telehealth legally uh, and under statute um, once the governor's executive orders expire. There are a couple of bills uh, on that would prohibit conversion therapy. Um, conversion therapy, I'm just going to give you the quick definition of conversion therapy. So conversion therapy uh, goes under a number of other names. Uh, it is the, um, it is typically done um, not by licensed folks, because if you are a licensed social worker, you are not, you should not be practicing this because it infringes on our guiding principles which are that, <coughs> excuse me, which are that we should never be causing harm to our clients. And conversion therapy, really it's, it is focused on um, working with a client who typically their children who are brought in by a parent or guardian who has a concern that the child has expressed that they uh, are questioning their sexual orientation, their sexual identity, um, and the parent is like, well, you know, my kid can't be gay. And so these are efforts to try and bring the child back to a normal setting. Um, there, there's no proof that it works. And in fact, it has been shown to increase suicide rates. Um, it has been called by many as uh, identified as torture. Um, so it's really, it's not, it's not proven to work. We all know that sexual orientation, gender identity, all those pieces have nothing to do with the biological makeup of your body. Um, it's not something that can just change uh, or that somebody can change your mind on. So um, these bills have not gotten a hearing. I don't know that they will, but they're out there. Um, and then there's a, a TANF eligibility bill that would allow, um, would increase eligibility criteria so that, uh, more people could be eligible for TANF. Um, TANF is our temporary assistance for needy families. The current eligibility guidelines have not changed since the 80s. The current benefit level has not changed since the 80s. Um, and it really should be used to be supporting families and in, you know, as they move into work environments. And the $288 a month that comes out of TANF really doesn't help anybody with much of anything. Um, and then we'll also be following the budget bill um, because all of our state funding is in there. There are, um, there. if you look, go to the General Assembly website, you'll see that there are hundreds of bills filed. So I cannot tell you that uh, all of them, you know, we are following the ones that we think are important at this point or ones that we are taking the lead on. Um, that includes, uh, 
like I said, Senate Bill 82. And then there are other things like the TANF um, eligibility bill. There's a group we work with. That is their lead bill. We provide support. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll be there and support them. We'll send out alerts if they'd like us to, those kinds of things. And so that's how we all work together to really be successful in what we do. Um, so most of you said you've gone to the General Assembly website, so you know that you can find uh, the text of the bills. You can also view um, the webcasts. There are also recordings, so you can actually see the recordings from the events. Um, if you've not hit our website, um, so the national website is socialworkers.org. That is also how you can find out about membership. There is, uh, when you go to socialworkers.org, on the right side of the screen towards the top, there's a join button. You can click on that. It'll take you to a page that help you uh, understand and explains all kinds of stuff around membership. Um, or you can click on the membership button. We have one of those two. Uh, the National Office has an advocacy center that works on federal level legislation and they provide some support to us in the states. We also, on our website, we uh, just launched our own advocacy center um, and uh, I do have just a few minutes. So um, I'll take you there quick. Maybe if this works, we'll see. Fingers crossed. I don't know. It's installing. This could take a minute. Um, but we just launched our advocacy center and um, maybe, maybe not. There we go. Uh, Sorry, it's taking a minute. I should have done, I should have had this open already. But we have an advocacy center on our website. Um, so you can go in and you can see our alert on Senate Bill 82. You can sign up for alerts if you'd like to get alerts from us. Uh, if you don't already, you can um, search for legislation. You can find your elected officials. And if you click on this button, uh, it will actually take you to uh, the list of all of the bills that we are following currently. Um, we're not, I mean, this is not every single topic because there are hundreds of bills. Um, so these are kind of the the big ones. And yes, a lot of them are listed as monitor because that is what we will be doing. Um, we cannot, I wish I could tell you that we could work on every single issue. We can't, um, we just don't have, we don't have the ability to do everything and be everything for everybody, even though I'd love us to be, whoops. Oh no, that wasn't supposed to happen. All right, let's go back to here. I always hit some wrong button during this. Um, so uh, I know Jill just put it in the um, uh, uh, in the chat box. We do have a post test. You'll also get it as an email. We would love for you to um, finish up our post test, let us know what you thought, and evaluate the sessions. We really are interested in knowing what you think. Um, you can, again, find out more information about us on our website. You can email us if you have questions. Um, if you are doing the, uh, if you're doing this as part of your school, uh, I would encourage you to please take, um, if you have questions that I have an answer today, um, ask your, uh, your faculty person if they still have questions or if you guys still have questions after that please let me know. I'm more than happy to send you guys emails with the answers or set up another time to talk. Um, I cannot talk to every single person who's come to our events because uh, you there we had 200 registered for today. By the time we're done with these, we will have uh, provided training to over 500 people. Um, but uh, please talk to your faculty and let them know. I am happy to try and help if I can. Um, are there any other questions? I don't see any, but I don't know if anybody has any other questions. If you do, you can uh, raise your hand or put them in the chat box. And um, we have we have seven minutes until 11.30, so. Whoops, oh no, and I still hit the wrong button. Um, Bear, I think people had asked before, but um, did you want to talk about if there's going to be a recording of the presentation and where uh, they can Yeah, so uh, we have we are recording this. We recorded the one that we did on Wednesday afternoon. Uh, that recording didn't work. So hopefully this recording works. And if it works, we will. Uh, we have to actually. There's a couple things that have to happen to the recording before it can be posted. 
but it will be posted probably on Monday. Uh, it'll be posted off of our website um, and it will be, we'll link it from our website, we'll, but it will be on our YouTube channel. And then we'll have a copy of this presentation will also be up on the, um, on our lead page. We'll put a copy of the presentation. So uh, if you have questions, you can, you, you can um, go through the presentation again. Like I said, I'm hopeful that this recording worked. If it didn't, we'll have to hope that Tuesday night's recording works. Uh, we can't always control the um, the recording process. I wish we could, but we can't. So, um, so with that, if there are no more questions, doesn't look like it. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, again, we will uh, we will have the the PowerPoint on the website, um, and if you could please finish up the uh, the post test and evaluation, we'd appreciate it. So, thank you all for joining us today, and you all have uh, I think you get like five minutes back for your day that you didn't have because um, we're done five minutes early. So, have a wonderful day, have a great weekend, and um, we will be in touch with a social work uh, virtual lobby day sometime later in the session once we get a better idea of what's happening with this session. So we'll see y'all later and thanks for joining us.